And so uh, let us uh, look at the Word of the Lord today. The Word of the Lord is powerful and it's uh, very active and it's convicting, isn't it? And it's challenging, challenges us as we want to live our lives in this world and uh, as we seek to please God at the same time. So we're in a special month right now. It's the month of Elul, Elul. And we're actually, uh, what is it, the ninth of Elul right now, I believe it is. And so uh, we are in the Jewish year 5,783. On the 15th of September, we're going to go into the new year, 5,784. All right, are you ready? Are you ready for the new year? Get your mind into it. Okay, this is a time of preparation. So the month of Elul is given to us for this purpose of preparing ourselves. And it's good because, you know, uh, these appointed times can come upon us uh, very quickly and we may not be ready for it. And if we're not ready for it, then we miss out on the significance of it. So we don't prepare for a high holiday uh, the night before or on the day that you come for the service. You start early, at least a month before it. And that's what... uh, Traditionally, the month of Elul <coughs> excuse me, is all about is preparing for the seventh and holiest day of the month. So Elul is the sixth month, the seventh day of the month, sorry, the seventh month is the month of Tishri, coming up on the 15th, the evening of the 15th of September. So you notice we have a lot of Chagim festivals coming up. It's going to be exciting. I looked at that calendar for a while. It's happening in three weeks' time, and uh, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Tabernacles. It's going to be really exciting. On the Feast of Tabernacles, we have our Russian-speaking friends coming to us from God's Glory Tabernacle, and um, Pastor Oleg and all those folks are coming to join with us, and uh, Seva will be on the flute once again, trying to get him more often than just once uh, every now and again. And Andre, you're going to be in that band. And it's great having Sever's brother, uh, Shmuley, here as well. Thinking of their family, mom and dad are still in Ukraine, serving the Lord in Ukraine amongst uh, the Jewish people in Odessa and all around the country. And they've, they've got family here too, which is lovely. But we're going to have a great time, so prepare. Also, just a quick reminder. On the 15th of September is Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, a celebration here with the blowing of the trumpets we are going to have dinner together afterwards. That's the first time. We've never done that before. Normally, you know, each family go off and go home to their, their dinners, but we decided let's have a dinner together. So you need to bring food for me and um, that I'll enjoy. Uh, and I'll bring food that you can enjoy. And so um, you might want to look at some traditional uh, meals for that night or whatever, just bring food, just uh, leave the shellfish and the pork at home, uh, or maybe not. But anyhow, just um, let's have a time of fellowship together, so we'll enter into the year 5784 together on that night. So uh, that should be a wonderful occasion. So that's coming up very soon. So this is a month of transition, according to Jewish tradition, and uh, apparently, too, in accordance to Jewish tradition, God gives us extra grace at this time to enter into this month and to realign our hearts with the Lord's. And one of the reasons is that the name of the month, Elul, it's spelled, of course, Aleph, Lamed, Vav, Lamed, is an acronym for a well-known verse in the Bible from Proverbs, sorry, from the Song of Songs, shall I say, chapter 6, verse 3, Ani le dodi ve dodi li. Ani ve dodi ve dodi li. That's what you should say to your beloved or to the Lord, if he's your only beloved in your life, in a sense, if you don't have a, a spouse. And so uh, the first letters of each one of those words from that verse spells out the month of Elul. And according to tradition, once again, the month of Elul is a time when Moses spent up on Mount Sinai to get the second set of tablets. How long did he spend up getting the second set? 40 days and 40 nights. 
So according to tradition, he ascended on Rosh Kodesh Elul, the beginning of the month Elul, and he descended on the 10th of the month of Tishri, which is at the end of Yom Kippur when repentance is completed, the time of forgiveness, time of seeking the Lord during this time. And during the month of Elul, from the second day of Elul to the 28th day, the shofar is normally blown in uh, the morning services, or even at your home during the weekday. So we didn't blow it on Shabbat. It's not traditionally blown on Shabbat during this time, but feel free. Blow it at home every morning and see what the neighbors say. <laughs> I don't think they'll like it unless they're Jewish themselves, but you can give that a go. So, and so this is a time also for personal introspection, time for preparation of the Three festivals, especially Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and a time of celebration for Sikot. And a time for us to deal with our personal sin. But also, the rabbis say, it's not good enough that we just deal with our sin between us and God. We also have to look after the horizontal relationships that's between each other. So there are times that, of course, uh, we need to not only be made right with God, but we need to be made right with one another as well. We have to be in right standing with God and with those around us. And so Elul is a time for reconnecting of old relationships that have been severed, perhaps. I've been thinking about this a lot lately. And what does it mean to be truly righteous? What does it mean? You know, I think it might be a little easier to be righteous in, in God's sight or be righteous in our relationship with God than it is to be righteous in our relationship with one another. Because our, our relationship with God is private and personal. And yet, it's very clear from the scriptures that righteousness is a two-way street. It's not just us and God. Righteousness has an effect on our relationships around us, and so there should be also righteousness that is experienced on the horizontal level as well. And that's difficult because it's, there's a lot of conflicts that occur in a family, in friendships, in fellowships. And what we must do is whatever it is in our power to do to try and make right with those around us. And this is the time of the year to do just that during the month of Elul as we prepare for the high holy days that are just three weeks away. So with that in mind, let's uh, see what the parasha has to teach us about this as well. So in parasha, ki tetze, uh, that comes to us from Deuteronomy 21. So we've been studying through the book of Devarim, the book of words, the words that Moses spoke to the generation that was just about to enter into the new land, the promised land. And the, the book of Devarim, the book of Deuteronomy, is a series really of sermons that Moses gives to the people of Israel. And they are a new generation, so he wants to see them transformed really before they enter into the promised land. Moses reminds them that they are called to covenant love with God, with God as their king. And this is also something we'll remember at Rosh Hashanah, God is our King. And at this uh, time, we also remember through reading the book of Deuteronomy that uh, the, perhaps the greatest expression of our love between God and Israel is found in a text in Deuteronomy, which we recite here, of course, for every Shabbat service, and that is the Shema. The Shema has not only shaped Jewish consciousness in every generation since Sinai, but this confession of faith also has profound implications on the way we live our lives. The Shema calls us not just to love God with all our heart, soul, strength, and might, but also to love our neighbor as ourselves. And that's what uh, Yeshua said was the most important commandment. And we are to bring all aspects of our lives, every section of our lives, every part of our lives under the Lordship of God. Every part. Nothing is to be left out. That's what the Shema teaches us. And so the book of Deuteronomy embodies this true sense of Torah 
as instruction how to live a life that demonstrates our love for God and to serve God in this world. And so we remember that it is God who delivered Israel from bondage and brought them into an inheritance. And we've, as I said last time, Devarim is a love letter, God's love letter to each one of us. So let's have a look at Deuteronomy 21.10, uh, the first verse in our parasha, Ki tetze la milchama, la milchama, warrior in some, uh, some versions or in some contexts. And it says there, when you go out to war against your enemies, and Adonai, your God, hands them over to you and you take them captive. And then the Torah goes into a whole lot of different laws that seem to be quite random, really. There's no logic, according to our normal sense of logic, in the rest of the Torah reading. There's a whole lot of laws. And uh, there's passages, and there are laws about lusting after foreign women. There are laws about marriage and divorce. There's laws about what to do with a rebellious son. There are laws about being responsible for your neighbor's donkey, the animals, and clothes. And there's laws about the inheritance of firstborn sons. There are laws about nocturnal emissions, ordinances against idolatry. There's laws about treatment of slaves, prostitution, eating your neighbor's grapes, giving of loans, conflict resolution, rules for street fighting, and not cheating by having correct weights and measurements. And so you can see that everything in life is kind of thrown in. And often in the Torah you find that there seems to be no real kind of flow, but a whole lot of laws are thrown in. And that tells us that uh, all of life is sacred to God. That is what we'll call Torah logic. It might not be logical to our minds, uh, in our kind of mindset today, but that's Torah logic. All of life is part of our relationship with God. All of life is holy. There's no such thing as this, the secular or the mundane. All is sacred unto the Lord, as we see in all these different laws. Rabbi Russ Resnick says, God steps into the midst of our secular concerns to show that among the redeemed there are no strictly secular concerns. All that we do reflects God's character, and God will reward behavior that reflects him accurately. So we see this Torah logic in the passage that have, uh, has already been read for us today, this passage about uh, you know, making sure that there are fair treatment for workers, there's personal responsibility for sin, justice for outsiders, and leaving gleanings. Just let's look at uh, those uh, ideas for a moment from... Uh, the passage that we had read this morning, Deuteronomy 24, 14 to 22. So at first, in verses 14 to 15, it talks about fair treatment of workers. And the text explains the fair treatment of hired servants, particularly those who are poor and needy. This reflects the ethical principle of treating workers justly and not exploiting those who are vulnerable by ensuring that workers are paid promptly and not taken advantage of. This passage promotes a sense of dignity and respect for all individuals, regardless of their social or economic status. Isn't it great that the Torah reminds us about that? Also in verse 16, it talks about personal responsibility. It underscores the idea of personal responsibility for one's actions and sins. Each individual is accountable for their own sins. And, they should, and uh, others should not be punishment, uh, punished for their sins, that uh, innocent family members should not be punished for the sins of others in their family. And this ethical principle discourages collective punishment and promotes a more just and equi equitable approach to justice. Again, uh, in verses 17 to 18, we see justice for outsiders, orphans, and for widows, and again, these verses emphasize the importance of impartiality and fairness in the legal system, specifically in cases involve, involving vulnerable individuals, such as 
outsiders in the Hebrew it's ger, orphans and widows. The commandment here highlights the need to remember one's own history. And Israel were slaves in Egypt. Now, because of what God has done, we need to make sure we treat people properly. It's true for all of us. We were all slaves to sin. And now we've been set free. We need to be careful how we treat others. Then there's this idea of leaving gleanings. The practice of leaving behind sheaves in the field, olives in the olive grove, and grapes in the vineyard for the benefit of outsiders, orphans, and widows demonstrates the principle of gleaning. This principle encourages those who have means to share a portion of their harvest with those who are less, less fortunate. You know, it wouldn't it be nice if you could walk past a, uh, an orchard and be able to taste of the fruit? The Torah tells us you can do that. You can't go there with a huge big basket and start to harvest the fruit, but you can taste uh, something from, the, uh, from the, the tree, from the orchard. It reminds me, in Israel often if you, I think it happens here too, but if you go to the, the markets in Israel, I love the markets, I always go to markets wherever I am in the world, it's just a wonderful cultural experience. In Israel, I love to take folks to the different markets, Machne Yehuda in Jerusalem, and uh, the uh, Hakamel market in Tel Aviv, and as you walk past, if you, you want to eat something, you know, you can stop and try something, try the olives. They don't mind. Try the, uh, the plum or uh, the nectarine or, or cherries. Uh, in summer, they have cherries there. And that's okay. Similar kind of thing. You can't go there with your bag and start helping yourself, but you can taste. Leave gleanings. It's a very good principle. Overall, these verses in the Torah remind, reminds us of our ethical responsible, responsibilities towards one another and our religious responsibilities. Uh, that we have as individuals and that we have as a community towards one another, particularly to those who are less fortunate. It reflects a vision of a just and caring society that is rooted in the values of the Torah, values of the whole Bible. So the way we treat others is a reflection of our relationship with God. If we worship God, we have to treat people properly because we are all made in the image of God. So if you don't treat a person properly, it reflects on your relationship with God. We're all called to be holy as God is holy. So the way we treat others must reflect the holiness of God. And this is not only a challenge to us personally, and it is a challenge to us personally, because in every aspect of life, you know, there, there are things that uh, we have to be mindful of. But it also is a challenge to every government in every country. As the wise Proverbs says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. So it's a challenge to us personally and how we conduct ourselves, but it's a challenge to our governments as well, including our government of Israel. Moses tells the Israelites, if they practice righteousness towards the needy, then the Lord your God may bless you in all the works of your hands. On the other hand, God warns the Israelites that if they are not open-hearted and generous to the poor among them, then it says there that he, that is the poor, will cry out against you to Adonai, and you will have sin on you. So it affects every area of our lives. You know, I love a bargain. I love going to go look for a new T-shirt. And uh, I like to get the cheapest price for my T-shirt. And it's a challenge for me personally when I think about that because, you know, I might land up with a $5 or $10 T-shirt that really is very cheap. But I need to also be very mindful of how was that T-shirt made? How come it came to Australia and I could buy it for $5 or $10? Who made it? What kind of conditions was it made in? And, you know, it's a challenge, therefore, to... Make sure that we, we are ethical in what we, we do in our lives, not just to try grab a bargain at the expense of somebody else, but to consider what it costs others. And as we know, in some places around the world, it's uh, like sweatshops and slavery, economic slavery is how some of these cheap prices come to us. The concept of righteousness with God and righteousness with those around us 
finds itself all the way into the Brit Chadasha. And we should not be surprised about this as Yaakov, this, the half-brother of Yeshua, teaches us. Yaakov, he was uh, the chief of, of the apostles in, in Jerusalem. He became really the first bishop, if you like, of Jerusalem. And he taught very much in line with Torah values and within a Jewish framework, as we found out when we studied James. You remember we studied the book of James? Who was here when we studied the book of James? Oh, Gavolt. Not many of you. All right, that's okay. Go online, and you can get the whole book of James that we studied. And so in James chapter 5, 1 to 6, we read uh, James's uh, really pretty stinging rebuke of the wealthy, the wealthy. Now, I'm pretty sure that Yaakov, James, was reflecting on our Torah portion that we have today when he was inspired by the Ruach HaKodesh to write this. Yaakov picks up on the themes of social justice, economic ethics, and care for the vulnerable in this pretty stinging rebuke of those who have accumulated wealth in unjust ways. There's nothing wrong with being wealthy, but how did you get there? These are, uh, this is a rebuke to those who have become wealthy in unjust ways and warns of the impending judgment for those who engage in such practices. Yaakov shows us that righteousness with God is reflected by the way we treat others. And so this is not just a word <clears throat> for those that we consider to be rich in our midst. It's a word for each one of us. We all in Australia are comparatively speaking, rich, comparatively to the rest of the world. So this is a prophetic rebuke, similar to some other passages in Scripture. You can see some, some Scripture like this in Leviticus 19, verse 13, Psalm 73, Isaiah chapter 5, verse 8, Malachi chapter 3, verse 5. And this is a rebuke to all of us, not to put our trust in things that become corrupted or be, can be decayed or can rust. They are doomed to decay. It is a rebuke on materialism and trusting in wealth with a special rebuke on being careful not to exploit others. In our desire to get a bargain, in our desire to get a, pr a best price for a service, we need to make sure that we are paying people properly and fairly and hopefully we don't get ripped off in the process ourselves. But uh, that's a different story. These verses are good verses for us to consider at this time. Check out your life. Think about how you're doing with your relationships. Think about how you're doing with your dealings with people in the world around you. God is concerned with the way we treat people as much as he's concerned with the rituals of our worship. The Torah and the Brit Hadashah teaches us that in the midst of all of uh, the things that we experience, God wants us to act redemptively. He wants us to seek his righteousness and live that out in our relationships. Yeshua, our Messiah, taught about this, of course, when he told his disciples that the most important commandment was loving God and loving others. Matthew 23, 37 to 39. The, the reason that the second command is like the first is because each is incomplete without the other. Our love for God is expressed in the way we love our neighbor. Our love for God cannot be expressed in our, in our religious life alone, but has to be made manifest in our lives and the way we treat others. How are we to be in right standing with God in the first place? How does that happen? How do we become righteous in God's sight, first of all? Well, the scriptures tell us we first receive righteousness as a gift. We receive righteousness, righteousness as a gift through faith in Yeshua the Messiah. Then we are to exercise that righteousness in our relationship with others. Let's have a look at this passage, Romans 3.21. But now God's righteousness apart from the Torah. So we're not just righteous by observing every mitzvot in the Torah. There's a righteousness that has been revealed that is apart from Torah. But, as the Apostle Paul says, to which the Torah and the prophets bear witness. This is not contradictory to the Torah, but this righteousness, namely the righteousness of God through putting trust in Messiah Yeshua, 
to all who keep on trusting. So there's a righteousness that we can receive that is different from the righteousness of Torah. It's a righteousness that we receive through faith. It's not contrary to Torah. It, in fact, fulfills Torah. But we receive it not by our deeds, but by our faith. To all that keep on trusting. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How many have fallen short? Just some people? No, all. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They, that's us, are set right as a gift of His grace through the redemption that is in Messiah Yeshua. God set forth Yeshua as an atonement. Hallelujah. And we're going to be celebrating that this year at the high holidays, and especially on Yom Kippur. Yeshua is our atonement through faith in his blood to show his righteousness in passing over sins already committed. And also in Romans 6.23 it says, For sins payment is death, but God's gracious gift is eternal life in Messiah Yeshua our Lord. It's a gift. Hallelujah. So true righteousness comes to us as a gift through faith in Yeshua, the Messiah. This righteousness must be then expressed, not only in our relationship with God, but in our relationship with one another. We cannot earn God's righteousness through doing good deeds. We can only receive it as a gift of God's grace. However, good deeds and true righteousness is reflected in the way we treat others. And of course, you can hear echoes from Yaakov's teaching in the book of James. So as we get closer to our high holidays, with Rosh Hashanah coming up on the 15th of September, as we enter into year 5784, remember that we are called to draw close to the Lord in righteousness and closer to one another in righteousness. This is a time of personal introspection and assessment of the way we live our lives before the Lord. So as the shofar blows at the Feast of Trumpets, I trust that we all heed its call and return to the Lord in repentance and reverence, while at the same time remembering that there is forgiveness for those who trust in Yeshua the Messiah. Let me just finish off with a couple of verses which I thought was going to be pertinent for someone here today or someone online. These verses are from the Haftarah portion for the week, and I couldn't gloss over them. What a beautiful portion. It is in Isaiah 54, just uh, three verses, three sections of Isaiah 54. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. The God of the whole earth he is called. What a beautiful verse. For a brief moment I deserted you, but with great compassion I will gather you in overflowing anger For a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. What a beautiful verse once again. And finally, for the mountains may depart and the hills may be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Let's give thanks to the Lord. Lord, thank you for all your word that's so rich and so wonderful, that's challenging though. And we pray for your help through the power of the Ruach HaKodesh in our lives to live like this, to do these things, to be great ambassadors for, for you in this world, Lord. So empower us so that we may be able to give glory to our Heavenly Father. Thank you for your word and thank you for your spirit that empowers us to keep it. We thank you, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen.